Today we're going to be looking at the original formation of the settler culture of the British colonists. And I think it's interesting to think about the way in which culture is shaped by the various people that uh, come to the various regions. Now, of course, the original settlers, uh, most of their descendants are, are still here, but they represent a, a significant minority of the population. The argument that David Hackett Fisher makes in a book called Albion Seed, where he looks at the, the original British uh, cultures in America, is based on the idea that the original settlers set up a culture and that all subsequent immigrants then assimilated to that culture. And there isn't just one American culture, there are many of them. So if you look at this map, this comes from uh, a book called American Nations by Colin Woodard. And as, as uh, David Hackett Fisher also suggests, uh, there are many different uh, nations or cultures within the United States and within the colonies before the United States existed. So if you look from top to bottom, Yankeedom, which is the one we'll be focusing on today, the, the regional identity of the Northeast, is the culture not only of New England, but also of the settlers as they move west through the upper Midwest uh, in areas like Michigan and Wisconsin. There, so the second uh, settlement uh, nation is New Netherlands, uh, New York City, uh, extending across the Midlands. This is the area, again, right through the middle of the swing states. Uh, this culture is very different from the culture to its south, which is Greater Appalachia. Greater Appalachia is not just the area around the Appalachian Mountains, but the settlement as it moves west uh, into East Texas, through Arkansas, Oklahoma. Uh, this is going to be a very different culture from both uh, the New England culture and from the deep Southern culture which is also distinct from the Tidewater. So um, looking at it this way, there are at least six different uh, nations, if you include New France, which is the area around New Orleans. So the sake of simplicity, we're just going to look at four of them. We're going to look at the Tidewater, Appalachia, New Netherlands, and Yankeedom. So we're going to start with the beginning, which is the emergence of the middle class Calvinists and the Puritans to New England. And as you can see, they come first. Uh, and they're going to be coming from a particular part of England, and they're going to bring that culture with them. So what I would ask you to think about is, and you can pause the, the video here if you want, is to think about the cultural patterns and behaviors that in some ways define New England as a whole. And I want you to think about today's culture. You know, what are the things that if somebody coming from another part of the country would say are, are distinctive about New England? So you could take a minute and list those things. I'm going to uh, jump forward, though, and look at where it is that New Englanders come from, because they don't just come from England. They come from a specific part of England, and that is the area around East Anglia. Now, East Anglia is the area in dark green uh, in the area to the northeast of London. Now, Essex and Suffolk and Norfolk, uh, these areas were areas uh, where there was a highly developed middle class in England. They were uh, religiously devout, but they tended to uh, be also very uh, interested in bringing their religion into their society and culture. So uh, they, were, they were religious people. It was one of the reasons why the Puritans wanted to reestablish this uh, in the New World. And not only did they bring their culture with them, they also brought the names of the cities with them. So if you look at East Anglia, You've got names like Rentham and Framingham and Malden and Chelmsford and Groton and Sudbury. And these all sound familiar because these names were place names that were brought from East Anglia to New England and specifically to the area around Boston. So you'll see these, these same place names, some of which have been re are repeated here. But the idea that, that, that uh, we're getting at here is, OK, the names were brought, but the culture was brought with, along with those names. So if you look at, uh, at, at the, this area of East Anglia and the people that came over, it's important to know that the original settlers came in families. They came in family groups. So the importance of raising their children was extremely important. Uh, the importance of education, most of these people were educated. Uh, they emphasized education. They emphasized worldly accomplishment, but not bragging about it. So it was about, you know, Define, distinguishing yourself without 
um, putting it in anyone else's face. Uh, so this is interesting because the old England, uh, particularly the sort of suburban, uh, quasi-rural, outside of the city uh, type of place, which really, if you think about it, defines both Concord and Carlisle, was very much what old England looked like. Uh, the idea of the commons, you, you, you would have um, large field areas, a little bit like Emerson, you have places that people would congregate. Uh, but again, this was middle class, it was family based, it was religious, but it was also about communal values. Now, if you really want to get at the essence of New England identity uh, back in England, you look at no further than Ben Franklin's Farmer's Almanac. And again, this was a best selling book in the 18th century. But if you look at these kinds of statements, um, early to bed and early rise makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise, right? So wisdom and wealth are valued. Um, they'll be sleeping enough in the grave. One thing people said about New Englanders, they were always in motion. They moved quickly. They almost ran when they, when they walked. Uh, it was all about industry. Um, it was importance, the importance of doing things and not being idle was a big piece of this. So New England culture was very much about, about busyness, about education, about instilling these values in children, making sure the children were educated communally uh, in, in, in uh, wholesome ways. Uh, there are also some outdated aspects of this culture, like the way that they would, this is interesting, this is a board that they would put between people who were courting each other, so you wouldn't be able to touch each other, but you could whisper through the pipe. So there was a certain amount of, of uh, there wasn't sexual chastity because half of the people who, when they got married, they were already pregnant. So the, the Puritans certainly um, were sexually active, but they didn't talk about it. It was sort of, the, the sex was something that was, um, uh, done but not spoken of uh, and certainly not bragged about uh, as it was uh, for example in the south in the Appalachian cultures which were much more sexually open. Now what's interesting is well what did the Puritans look like and how did they dress? Uh, one of the things that define Puritan culture if you look at an L.L. Bean catalog you're actually looking at a modern version of what Puritans wore and they call these these things sad colors not to bring too much attention to yourself so these muted colors muted reds uh, browns, off-color greens, olives, things like this. This this was about um, demonstrating, a, 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 you know, not too much attention, not bringing too much attention to yourself, uh, demonstrating a certain humility uh, under God, but also a certain humility um, where you're not bringing too much attention to yourself. So these sad colors, these muted colors you see in the um, uh, in the shields and in the colors of the original Ivy League. And of course, New England was defined by education, uh, specifically by higher education. So whether it was Yale or Dartmouth or Harvard or Brown, um, the colors were, were also sad colors. So you can see not only the emphasis on the color, but also the emphasis on education. Uh, Princeton is the one uh, university here that's not, um, it's, it's, it's in the Ivy League, but it's not part of the New England uh, part of the Ivy League. And even at S.H.I.E.L.D., and even the idea of Princeton suggests hierarchy, uh, unlike the quality that was emphasized in the New England uh, area settlement. Now, the other thing that's interesting about New Englanders is the way that they educated their children. Uh, unlike the South, uh, where uh, private tutors were hired, uh, New Englanders decided to send their children out. So sending out your children was sending them to boarding schools. And this was very much within the, uh, the old England and New England culture. Um, you wanna send them out to places where they will be in uh, settings that are a lot like uh, the towns that they were living in. So literally you reconstruct the town, uh, you, you move the children into them uh, and you, you educate them and you have other adults educating your children, um, which is it's going to be extremely important. The other thing about education was this idea that you needed to break the will of the child. Uh, there was a, a lot of concern about disobedience uh, amongst the Puritans. Um, they believed in this so strongly that there was actually a death penalty for rebellious uh, sons of over 16 that refused to obey their parents. Uh, 
they're spoken of the importance of stifling stubborn rude and unruly children so if you were uh, a, a a thumb sucker um they would put something over your uh, over your thumb to make you stop doing that. They'd whack you on the head with ceramic thimbles. Uh, my mother, who was raised in a, an old New England family, when she put her arms on the table, she might find herself getting whacked by uh, the butt end of a, of a knife by her, by her father um, or even grandfather, um, because it was, again, trying to instill table manners and these sorts of things. So uh, mandatory schooling laws were also very important in New England, and, and this is going to be an important piece of uh, the culture. So the importance of education, uh, the importance of the work ethic, this idea of the Protestant work ethic, the importance of time management, uh, fear of sexual deviancy, these were all part of New England culture. Now, the last part of this was also extreme in-group, out-group dynamics, um, fear of people who were different. Uh, fear of people who were who who were deviant, particularly in areas around belief systems. So people who had different political or religious beliefs were uh, seen to be threats to the community. I'm not sure how much that still exists, but you might think about how uh, liberal New Englanders view Republicans, for example, or Trump voters. This idea of of, of severe judgments of people, usually with with moral uh, elements to them too. So uh, if you look at uh, New England presidents, John Adams, of course, famously was extremely moralistic, uh, saw things in this way. Um, his son, John Quincy, was one of the smartest of all of the presidents. He spoke five languages. Uh, he had an incredibly high IQ. Uh, he was a Harvard professor. Uh, his intellect was valued and uh, was emphasized. Uh, and, so, and so this idea of, of moral values and educational uh, achievement, and even John Kennedy, if you say, well, John Kennedy was, wait a second, he, he was an a Irish Catholic. Well, he was, but he was, according to his theory, he was brought into a New England culture. He was raised in a prep school. He went to Chode Academy. Um, and so in this prep school, he was surrounded by other New Englanders. And so he, he incorporated this idea uh, or this culture into his own identity. So again, this idea of the best and the brightest, the people that surrounded Kennedy and his administration, this is a very New England idea that you're, that you're known for your intelligence, you're known for, your, for, for, for the company that you keep. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt as well, while not an intellect, uh, surrounded himself uh, with people who, progressives who, who, who helped put together the New Deal. These people were all Ivy educated, most of them from Columbia, uh, but most of them with New England roots. George H.W. Bush, uh, as well, uh, went to Andover, uh, then then went to Yale. Um, the same idea of uh, even for uh, moderate Republicans, uh, communal values, uh, these sorts of things. So if you look at how all of this plays out um, and how these cultural patterns play out in modern uh, New England, we have extremely low rates of unemployment uh, relative to the rest of the country. Uh, we have very high rates of college attendance uh, amongst all parts of our demographic. Uh, we have low rates of violent crime. Of course, this is also, also related to our attitudes towards guns. We also have low divorce rates. So if we continue to value uh, uh, families and, and, and cohesiveness, we also are relatively um, segregated, not only along class, but also racial lines, which is also the way that New England was um, back when it was first settled. There people from, from groups did not tend to mix, they tended to stay separated. We have a very strong uh, Democratic Party. A um, hundred years ago, it was the Republican Party, but this idea of collective liberty was very much within the New England way of looking at things. Liberty was not defined individually, it was defined by the community. Last thing significant to Concord and relative to, to, uh, relevant to Concord is the importance of the town meeting. So strong local town-based political involvement, this is still the case. In a lot of New England towns, this is where uh, the heart of civic involvement is. Uh, and also this idea of collective justice, and some of you can probably identify with this, this idea that it's not individuals that are doing bad things. If some, somebody does something wrong, the whole community has to be re-educated. So the anti-bullying curriculum, which comes up because of a couple people that were doing bad things, everybody has to do this. So all these things together are part of this uh, New England identity that comes originally from the Puritans 
Uh, and this is the theory.